Thanks very much indeed. And I should start by saying uh, thank, a huge thank you to the Centre for Charity Effectiveness for having us um, hosted in this wonderful venue this evening. Uh, it's perfect in terms of being able to support this fascinating topic that I know you've all come to see and hear about this evening. My name is Mark Williamson. I'm Director of Action for Happiness. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of words about what it is we do and why we're putting on this event and, and very much vigorously supporting the launch of Henry's book and this initiative today, um, why we think it's so important. Um, and I think the starting point for why Action for Happiness as an organisation exists is really this graph. We're in the world of business and, and the workplace today, so I'm sure you won't mind me showing a little bit of data. But um, this shows the trends in both wealth, uh, GDP per capita, in blue here, the top line, and, and in happiness, um, measured through levels of life satisfaction over um, about the last 60 years, or well, it's not entirely up to date, this particular graph. Um, and what we can basically see is that, in short, we have got richer, considerably richer on average over that period, and no happier on this measure or indeed any other measure where we have data. Now, the data on our life satisfaction, our happiness, is not all that great historically, but we have now, going forwards, a, a much better way of, of measuring the nation's well-being. I'm sure many of you are aware of the changes going on in the UK to measure our, our well-being. But this raises a lot of questions about what are our priorities as a society if we've been investing so much in growing our economy and yet not, not transferring that into improvements in our perceived quality of life. Um, so Action for Happiness, as many of you will know, I think many of you have been involved and perhaps come to our previous events, um, but for those who haven't, we are basically creating a movement of people and organisations who care about these issues, who believe that the most important thing for society should be improving people's overall well-being rather than just um, focusing on creation of, of wealth. Um, we launched only earlier this year in April. We already have something like 18,000 members and a whole host of partner organisations who are all working together in this area. And our role really is to take the science, the evidence, what we know about well-being and, and how to increase happiness and crucially how to help alleviate unhappiness in, in its various forms and to help use that information to help people take action, to make a difference in their homes, in their workplaces, in their communities. So there's a variety of things we're doing in local community groups, in schools and in other areas. But of course, this evening is all about the workplace. Um, and Henry will, of course, explain all about the, um, the opportunities we face uh, and have open to us with, with creating happier places to work. But it's worth, I think, just being a little bit aware, reminding ourselves of the context here. And these are very difficult times in terms of happiness at work. And perhaps even aside from the, the current economic circumstances, over the last decade we've seen things moving potentially in a, in a difficult direction. And from an individual's perspective, more than half of people in the UK say they're unhappy at work. Nearly 70% say that increasing levels of stress have been an issue for them in the last three years. And of course that translates into big missed opportunities and problems for organisations. Anxiety and stress are estimated to cost the UK economy £26 billion pounds each year and very high proportions of senior people in, in organisations, let alone um, other staff, are seriously considering leaving their jobs um, due to um, you know, not feeling happy and, and fulfilled in their current working environment. So what we're going to talk about this evening is hugely important. There's a really big missed opportunity to get this right. Um, I'll introduce Henry in a moment, but just briefly before I do that, there are a couple of other things we've got coming up that you may be interested in, and I'll just very quickly mention those. We're doing these roughly monthly. Next month, we're doing a film screening of a wonderful, inspiring film called I Am, which is basically the story of a Hollywood film director who was very seriously injured in a, in a, in a cycling accident and came to question this amazing wealth and supposed success that he'd built up. And basically, he travels around the world meeting leading thinkers in psychology, faith, um, various forms of um, science and other disciplines, and asking the questions of... Um, what, what, what can we do about the problems of the world? And, and the solutions he, he finds in that journey are very inspiring and basically show how interconnected we are all at a, at a level that we perhaps don't, we often take for, for granted. So do come along and, and watch that film. It's going to be in Notting Hill on the 7th of December. And then in January, we're delighted that Nick Marks, who's actually one of the board members of Action for Happiness um, and was in just in Forbes uh, magazine last week as having one of the, seven, the supposedly seven most important ideas of the year with his work on, on measuring um, well-being and happiness. This is him talking at, at TED about um, the Happy Planet, Planet Index and his work on 
um, sustainability and well-being. Um, so that's going to be a wonderful, inspiring talk in January. Do join us then. Um, but let me turn to this evening. Um, if you'd like to find out more about Action for Happiness, our details are here. But this evening is all about happiness at work. And we're absolutely delighted to have Henry Stewart here. Um, if you haven't had a chance to look at the book and the, the contents online um, already, and you don't have, haven't bought a book already, then please do check this out. I think what we're going to hear tonight is, is fundamental to a, a rethink, a call for change in our organisations and the way we treat people. Um, Henry has set up a company called Happy, which he, I'm sure he'll tell you more about, but from his own experience of how not to run happy companies, has created one that is based absolutely on the principles you can hear about this evening. So this is not research, it's not hearsay, it's something that's been lived and breathed in an organisation that's then gone on to win awards for great customer service, awards for the best places to work. So um, uh, you know, Henry's book, I wanted to read you this one quote that was sent in to, uh, in connection with Henry's, Henry's book, which I think is setting the scene nicely for this evening. Um, this person had written, I feel how I imagine people must feel when they find religion in the, in the context of <laughs> Henry's work on happiness at work. So please join me in welcoming Henry and uh, listening to his views on how to create happier workplaces. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, and th I, again, would like to particularly thank Cast Business School for their uh, huge generosity and, and great organisation in, in, in hosting this, and for Mark and Action for Happiness in organising this. I, I think it's one of the most important pieces of work that's going on at the moment in terms of working out how we create a happier society. I'd like to thank all of you for coming, uh, and particularly my family and my parents who have come from Birmingham, and who are foundation of all of this because they taught me that you could be principled in work whatever you did um so anyway let me who knows about who's i assume you've all heard of happy do you all know happy hands up if you know happy okay normally at business conferences when i'm speaking that's about one hand but um uh happy if, in case you don't know we started off training in it making learning about computers fun and involving and we've moved on to training people to create happy workplaces and as Mark said, we've won one or two awards along the way. Um, we were, for five years, um, in the top 20 best workplaces in the UK. And so what I'm going to be talking about today is some of the ideas that we, from practical experience, uh, I know create happy workplaces. And we've also had the good fortune to, to meet with all the other top workplaces and get all the best ideas from people like Microsoft, Google, Gore, and those kinds of people. So we nick those ideas wherever possible, and I want to encourage you all to nick any ideas from happy that you can. So let me start off with our core principle. People work best when they feel good about themselves. Hands up if you'd agree with that. Good, good. I like this audience. It's good. OK. In that case, what should the main principle of management be, if that is true? What should be the focus of management? Anyone? Encouragement, praise. Encouragement, praise, making people feel good. Okay. Hands up, those of you who work in organisations where the main focus of management is to make people feel good. Oh, we've got a few. Yes, good acting for happiness, I put my hands up. Hopefully the... <laughs> yeah. Good people from happy have put their hands up. That's good, too. Um, now... I, I'm serious about this. You might, you know, it sounds a bit, a bit jokey, but I'm actually very serious about this. And I want to tell you about a piece of research done by Nando's. How many of you know Nando's? Everyone, yeah? You've eaten their chicken restaurant based all over the country. They wanted to find out why it was that some of their branches grew and were very profitable and some of them didn't. So they did a huge piece of research to correlate all sorts of factors, you know, location, qualifications, all sorts of things. And they came up with one factor above all, that correlated most closely with, with commercial success. Any guesses what that was? There's a slight clue at the back. Um, <laughs> it was how happy staff said they were in that annual survey. That was the closest correlation. So what was interesting was what they then did was they changed the manager's bonus system. So that instead of bonusing managers on sales and profit, which is what they still wanted, 50% of managers' bonuses became based solely on how happy staff said they were in the annual survey, because they realised that's how you got 
the sales and profits. So this is going to, there's going to be a bit of interaction in this session. You're going to get a chance to talk and discuss. So I want you to turn to your neighbour and answer the question, how would your organisation be different if that was the main focus of management, making people feel good? And it isn't, would this be a good idea? I'm not wanting you to discuss that at this point. I'm asking, how would your organisation be different if that was the main focus? Two minutes on that. Very short thoughts. How would your workplace be different if that wasn't a focus? Anyway. Somebody shout out. I wouldn't be doing much of a school because <laughs> my manager would say, you're all wasted in that position. Nando's and you know, just had uh, you know, some interesting thoughts about it. Does it stand up to hard analysis? Well, that's an interesting question because there's a, a guy called Alex Edmonds at Wharton Business School in the States who decided to analyse that because the best place to work awards have been going for about 25 years now. So he asked the question what would happen if you went back and looked at the stock market and what if you invested each year in the 100 best places to work and compared that to investing in the stock market? Okay, and tracked that over 25 years, did incredibly thorough economic analysis on it, taking all other factors out of it. And what he found was they was what he said was a, a four, <coughs> which I don't even remember saying, a four alpha differential of 3.5%. percent Have you know what a four alpha? No. Oh, you do? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea, but anyway, I tried to make that. Um, uh, okay, something you won't let by chance. So basically, it's the difference between investing in the stock market and investing in the best workplaces was 3.5% a year. Now, that's pretty good for Alpha P? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what it means is that you'd inv if you'd invested your pension over 25 years in that, and if in the stock market what would have got £100,000, invest in the best in the happiest workplaces, it would have got £230,000 by the end of that period. That's the financial benefit of happy workplaces. Now, and even, I don't know if we've got any financial directors here. Any financial directors? No? If we had, I feel there is now a pretty convincing case that it absolutely makes business sense. Yeah? Um, so let's think about when did we work at our best. I want you to have... Just one minute with your neighbour. I want you to come up with Alec, the occasion when you absolutely work at your best. I know we all work hard all the time, we all do great work all the time, but particular time you're incredibly you're productive, you're motivated. One more thing, what was it about it? One minute chatting to the other neighbour. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so has everybody got in mind a particular personal occasion when you were absolutely working at your best, yeah? So let me ask you some questions about that. For how many was the time when you were particularly well paid? Oh, one? Two? One and a half, maybe? Okay, how, for how many was the time when communication from management was particularly strong? <laughs> <laughs> some, but, nobody? Normally that gets a few, that normally gets a third. You've got about 10% this time. For how many was the time when you were challenged? Ah, oh, that's about three quarters, maybe, maybe more, 80%. How many was the time when you were trusted and given freedom to do it your way? Okay, I think that's definitely 90%. And it, we, I get this very consistently, that if you want to look at when people worked at their best, 
It's not about, if you ask people first what makes great management, they would generally talk about well, it's communication, it's vision, it's that kind of thing, but very rarely about the trust bit. Yeah. And what actually makes great management, because what makes great management is what enables people to work at their best. And what that is about is trust, freedom and support. Because yeah. great management for me is very much about getting out of the way. Now, if it's about, what, what I often get people saying when I talk about it being about trust and freedom, yeah, they say, yes, but it's important to have those things like communication and uh, those kinds of things, yeah? So let me just explain it by going back to Maslow. Who remembers Maslow? Everyone remembers Maslow? What was at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Survival, Survival basic needs. What was at the top? <laughs> I think you read a different version to me. But, um, as most of you said, it was self-actualisation. Yeah? Um, so we need these. These are, these are vital to enable, you know, when we haven't got those, those are what motivate us, aren't they? Being able to get a meal, being able to ha have safety, a bed to sleep in. But once we've got those, more of those don't motivate us. Yeah? What actually motivates us then is belonging, self-esteem, and this idea of being in command of our lives. So, I have an alter a management alternative of that, which I'm afraid doesn't have any sex in it, but um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's this. That these are necessary. We need to have communication. We, we kind of need to be paid, well, decently. Um, but that isn't what motivates us, despite what the city does and believes. That isn't what motivates us to great achievement. What motivates us are the top part, support, challenge, freedom and trust. That's what I've found in all the people I've asked and all the people we've dealt with. So, if you look at British organisations, or most, most of the world probably, which end of that pyramid do most companies focus on? The bottom or the top? The bottom. Which do you think the very best organisations, the very best workplaces uh, focus on? Absolutely. And that's the change that I want us to think about today, how we shift the organisations we work in from focusing on the, those kind of basic things to really giving people that freedom. Which is a, raises a whole question about what management is about. And as I say, I believe management is about getting out of the way. And there's a trap uh, of what I call the um, myth of the clever manager. Yeah. How many of you saw a programme called Boss Swap? Uh, about eight years ago. Anybody see it? Somebody, somewhere. One person, in, two people in the audience. It's, you've seen Wife Swap, yeah? It's a bit like that, except not quite as exciting. But two managers sw swapped, swapped uh, companies um, and ran the other company. Yeah? It, there were three programmes, so six swaps. It never ran again, and if you saw what happened in those companies, you might understand. Because what, what those managers did was they walked into companies they'd never been in, in sectors they had no experience of, and started telling people what to do. Yeah? Because their whole self-image as managers was that they were a manager because they were cleverer. They knew better how to do things. And their whole justification had to be for themselves in a new organisation was they had to make better decisions. One manager... One of the six was different. They walked into the organisation and they walked around the shop floor asking people, what do you need? What's getting in your way? What, do you enable, what will enable you to do better? And that was the only organisation of the six that became more effective over the two weeks of the programme. So we've got to switch managers out of that way of thinking into thinking of themselves, not, there to, to, not in the old command and control, but there to support and give that freedom. So... If management is about getting out of the way, let me give, let me look practically at what that could mean. How many of you, how many of you are managers first? Okay, fair number. How many of you who are managers, have been managers, uh, get people to, to, to come up with a solution to a problem or come up with a new plan and then report back to you? How many people have, do that? Okay. Okay, what I want to suggest to you is that Next time, you say, come up with uh, the plan and don't show it to me. Okay? Approve the idea before they've thought of it. The, the concept is called pre-approval 
Oh, sorry, that was, that's coming next, ne later. Um, the concept is, is pre-approval, and the idea is that you as a manager don't approve it. Yeah? To, give an, to give an idea of this, a trainer recently um, came to me and, and told me, they said, I love the three things that have changed in the way you set up training at Happy. You know, they make it so much easier for me and easier for, for, the cus for, the cus for our students. And I looked at the three things, and the first thing that struck me was, I didn't know that happened. Yeah? Because they hadn't come across my desk for approval. The second thing I noticed was, if they had come across my desk for approval, I'd have rejected two of them. Because, you know, I set up how we do things at Happy. I used my best thinking, you know. Those were clever ways of doing things. I, as a manager, am a complete block on change. But, of course, if it comes across my desk, you can't ignore it, can you? You know, if it comes across your desk, you start, you know, making helpful suggestions. How many people have had their, their best ideas improved by their manager? <laughs> Been a good experience? Um, so how you avoid that is by pre-approval. Um, this, this picture is our cafe at Happy, and it's one of the things that we pre-approved. Some people wanted to improve the cafe. I don't know if they're here. Are they outside, Debbie and Matt? Okay. Um, uh, that they wanted to change things, so we agreed a budget, we agreed, you know, a uh, general idea that, that this is the kind of brand of happy is, is, is bright. And the first time I saw it was when I walked in the room, when I walked in the cafe the day after they, they, they'd done it. So, quick chat uh, again with somebody else, maybe the person behind you this time, or someone near you, whatever. Um, what would it be like to pre-approve, to say, here's the parameters, here's the budget, you go away and come up with a solution and don't show it to me. Just implement it. A couple of minutes on that. What would we like to pre-approve? <laughs> What would it be like to pre-approve it? Any immediate thoughts? Scary. Yeah. Scary. Oh. <laughs> Liberating. Any others? I get a lot more free time. Get a lot more free time. Absolutely. <laughs> Any others? Responsibility. <coughs> Responsibility. Responsibility of delegation. Yeah. Responsibility of delegation. Absolutely. And let me pick up on the more free time because there's an example where we did this. We had a charity we were working with. They wanted us to come in and find out why the people were so miserable. Okay. <laughs> We'll come and do that for you, if you like, by the way. We'll, uh, um, and we talked to them, and one of the reasons they were so miserable was because they had anything they did, anything they wrote, went up to three levels of approval. Yeah? One of the people actually said they deliberately put uh, things that were wrong in their press releases just to see if anybody would spot it. Because <laughs> it wasn't their responsibility what went out. But we talked to the senior, uh, the senior managers, and they said, oh, yes, but we can't let them write whatever they like. The whole authority... <coughs> And responsible, you know, image of our organisation depends on what goes out. We have to approve it. <coughs> okay? So you've got a, a real reason for discontent. You've got a real reason they do this. What's the solution? Anybody? <coughs> Specific guidelines. Specific guidelines, is it? Yeah? Shared, shared agendas. Shared agendas, yeah. I mean, that, that's the agenda, yeah? Find someone you trust to actually speak to you over it. Yeah, find someone you trust. Just to prove 90% so we say that again. Approve most of them unless they're really stupid. Approve ninety percent of them unless they're stupid. You say, okay? It's a, that's the kind of thing. What we, the question we ask: What is it that people three levels up know that the frontline staff don't? Work that out. Train those people in that. Approve that. You can you can test them as well if you like. You know, just to make sure. Um, certify them and then say they can go and and do those press releases. The effect was transformative. The organisation was amnesty, and a lot of it was about death sentences. And if you don't get the press release out the same day, it could have happened. Because in China, it happens the next day. Um, but what was most interesting was going back to the chief exec ten years later, when I, when I wrote the book, the stories in the book, and asking if it worked. And he said, yes, but the biggest effect, and this comes back to your comment, was on the managers. Because before they'd literally been spending half their time checking what everybody else was doing. So everything was being done twice. Suddenly, they were freed up to do their actual job of supporting their people and doing the strategy. And they still got the assurances because they knew the people were doing the stuff, kind of stuff they asked for. You know, within the guidelines, within the training and all that kind of thing. 
So let me go back to the uh, elusive picture before. Um, this is Marion Jana, who is here somewhere. So Buddy's here as well, actually. Okay, and Buddy's here as well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is, this is a, a story that's in the book. Um, and it's a remarkable story of, of what happens if you take a different approach to, to change and to management. In fact, Marion isn't a, a manager. What she decided was she wanted to change the way acute mental health wards were run in this country. Okay. Now stop for a moment and think, what would be, let's say the government decided to do that, what would they do? Any, any thoughts? How would they approach it? They might throw some money at it. If that's, well, not this government, I think, but... Uh, <laughs> anything else? They talk about it for the next ten years. What was that? Consultation paper. Consultation paper. They'd, um, and they'd probably then set down... Well, first of all, they'd probably tell the sector how crap they were. Yeah? How lots of people probably needed to be sacked. This kind of approach that they use in education, certainly. Um, and then they set a whole set of ways everybody had to do and then set absolute targets they had to do. And it would be really... And then they'd ask, why aren't people motivated by this? Why are they resisting change? Yeah? What Marion did, and she wasn't a manager, she had actually never worked in the mental health sector, she'd been a service user of it. Uh, but she saw there was, uh, there was potential for change, so she actually came up with a booklet of 75 ideas. No compulsion, just lots of ideas. She came up with lots of examples of mental health wards that were doing it really well. I.e., she wanted to make people feel good. Because people are more open to change if they feel good. Um, she put this out in an entirely supportive way. And people in the sector started adopting this and started uh, you know, spreading their own ideas. It has got to the point now where over 90% of mental health wards are a member of her campaign, which is called Star Wards. Um, if you go into a mental health ward now, you'll find it very different to what it was five years ago. And she actually was awarded an OBE for her work. She's left, actually, but so I could um, praise her to the high heavens now. She, now. Um, but that, for me, is a remarkable story of the opposite of the top-down management approach, the enabling approach. Because people often are thought to resist change. They don't resist change. They resist being changed. They, if you involve them in change, they're very... They, they very much uh, can take part and can be part of that. Yeah. Another story, actually, I'll tell Dee's story, if I can, Dee, <laughs> about making people feel good. Dee's story was about a debt he was trying to collect. This works, this philosophy helps your people to work better, it helps all your relationships. He had a debt, and if I'm, if I'm right, the last negotiation on the debt had ended in the words, see you in court. Yeah? Um, it wasn't going particularly well. Um, and then he, he reflected, he, I think, read Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, which he, he, he's, he's in an office and that was sitting on the, on the shelves. And he thought, OK, he knew this person had been going through a bad time. He knew he had family illness. So he rang him and didn't discuss the debt at all. He showed concern, asked him about his family, had a really good, uh, good talk. No mention of the debt. Two days later, there was a cheque in the post. Yeah, the guy had paid, I think, a part of the debt, and two weeks later paid the whole debt. Yeah? Because if you f focus on relationships and making people feel good, you get a completely different result. Yeah? So one more minute with your neighbour. Where could you make someone feel good to improve the way your organisation or your relationship with your supplier works? One minute on that one. OK, how many people think they can make a difference in some part of the organisation based on that simple philosophy of making people feel good. Good. The others of you try. See what happens. <laughs> and it's very much the action for happiness philosophy, isn't it? That you can personally make a difference. You know? Obviously, if we can get you know, the head of the organisation on board in transforming the way management works, that could make a big difference. But each of us can make some difference. So let me, let me kind of put this into, into a kind of bit of a model, because some people at this point are that fee, often feel this is sounding a bit hippie-ish. Yeah? You probably all are a bit hippie-ish here, so it doesn't matter. But, um, <laughs> um, I did have one friend who was given a job with a three-word job description, which was, do cool stuff. That was it. That was, as you might guess, an internet company in the last boom. And I'm not sure it's still around, actually. But, uh, <laughs> 
because that isn't what we're advocating. Most of us want to know that... Uh, what some guidelines? You know, let me ask a question, actually. If you're given three choices, be told what to do, be given complete freedom, or given freedom within guidelines, I'm going to ask you which of those three you would want. So how many like being told what to do? Hands up, anybody? OK. How many like complete freedom? OK. Three, four, five, six. <laughs> That's a slightly higher proportion than normal. How many like freedom within guidelines? OK, that's about 80%. When I've done this in, you know, in, in opinion poll format, we generally get 4% want to be told what to do, 6% like complete freedom, and 90% want freedom within guidelines. And that's what we get in our staff surveys, that, yes, give, tell us what you want, give us the guidelines, give us the, uh, you know, work with us on, on what the actual framework is, but give us freedom, please, to do what we want. So, let me, let me just tell you the happy story, to put this in perspective. Because I started out um, in my back room in Hackney, 20 years ago, uh, starting to do IT training. Uh, and I have to confess, I was a bit full of myself. I thought my big challenge would be to find other people as good at it as me. I was a little lacking in the humility. Um, so when I started recruiting people, I would make detailed notes through the day of what they did right and what they did wrong. And then at the end of the day, I'd sit down with them and feed it back. <laughs> How do you think that went down? <laughs> uh, lead balloon is normally what, 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 what <coughs> comes up. Um, but I was actually falling into a couple of quite common management traps. How many of you had, have known a manager who wanted people to do it exactly the way they did? Yeah? And one of the things about that, when you're trying to create a clone, you can only have a second best clone. They can only, the best that can be is the same as you. And the, the other trap is to think that if you, if you set, you know, if you do this, 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 and this, you'll get, always get this result. That might work in manufacturing. It doesn't generally work with people, because people are different. But at the same time, I didn't want to say to people, train how you like. Because how many of you have been on IT training in the last few years? Hands up. Keep your hands up if you found it a fun and involving experience. <laughs> okay, one, two. You didn't come to happy, did you? Did you, come to happy? you did, good. <laughs> the standard way of training at the time, and still a bit at the moment, was to stick a tech in front of the class and they tell you which button to press. Have you had that sort of training? It's not very engaging. So we wanted, we didn't want to say, well, do whatever you want, but we didn't want to say, do this, this, this. So we came up with the job ownership framework, which was a set of principles, which can be summed up as don't tell when you can ask. Yeah? Um, which is the still the core basis of our training. And probably of our, of our management as well. Um, and a set of targets based around being confident and capable in the software. Another element of it is support. Is support the same as management? <coughs> Some, yeah. Some people might say it's the same as good management, but the key here is the support is what this person wants. And it might be they go to the manager, it might be they go to a colleague, it might go to all sorts of places. And the other key element is feedback. How often do most of us get feedback in our jobs? Once a year, somebody said? Any advance on that? When you've done something wrong. When you've done something wrong? Um, most, of, most people report that they get feedback based on their appraisal every six months or every year. Yeah? And for me, that's a bit like, say you're playing a football, you're playing a game of football, you, you kick a goal, and you find out whether you scored six months later. <laughs> In fact, you find out six months later whether your manager thought you were going to score. Yeah? Or thought you scored. Which uh, <coughs> wouldn't do much for improvement, would it? So, where should the feedback come from? The manager or someone else? Where should it come from? Everyone, particularly... The customers, whether internal or external customers, should it go to the manager or should it be the, the person themselves? That, that gets it directly. Absolutely, to be fully owned, it's not the manager's interpretation. So let's just quickly look at this model. Who should decide the principles, the organisation or the individual? Everyone, possibly, yeah. Although, you, you know, there is a case for the organisation. Let's go back to my amnesty case. Let's say you start work there and you say, well, I quite believe in the death penalty. You know, tough. You've got to accept the principles of the organisation. You know, I, I hope they'll develop over time with you, 
Um, targets. Who should set the targets? The individual or the manager? A few people saying managers, a few people saying together. Let me ask you a couple of questions. According to all research, who sets the tougher targets? The individual or the manager? The individual, according to research, sets tougher targets. Who, when do you think they're more likely to be achieved? When the individual sets them or when the manager sets them? So who should set the targets? Absolutely. And I, I, one of our clients recently um, decided to do this with their salespeople, gave them all a two-day training course on the, how to set targets and how to, how to uh, do this kind of thing, and ended up with all of them setting targets uh, above where he would have set them. And the last time I talked to him, they were well on the way to achieving them. So, uh, shall I have another interaction? No, let's carry on. Um, there's quite a, there's, the book has ten key principles, and I think I'm going to manage to cover about four or five, but all the rest are in there. So I'm going to quickly skip the next one, which was <laughs> intriguing for you. <laughs> you can ask about that later if you want. Um, but let me come on to the most radical belief that we have. We believe that you should choose people, you should choose who manages people based on how good they are at managing people. <laughs> it won't work, it won't catch on, he says. Because what are people normally chosen to manage on the basis of? Their technical ability. Their technical ability. And anything else? How long have they been there? So if you've got a programmer who's been there for 10 years, um, what's going to happen to them? They'll make them a manager because the fact they're great at coding is sure to mean they're great at nurturing and supporting people. Yeah? <laughs> but it happens throughout. It's not just programmers. It's, 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 how many of you have had managers like that who are great at the technical but not good? Yeah? Quite a lot of you. Yeah? Okay, because for me, if you look at the roles of management, let's say strategy, decision-making, supporting, challenging, nurturing... Is that a fair summary of the roles, the skill sets? What's odd about that combination? Absolutely. We have here two roles. We have role A, strategy and decision making. We have role B, supporting, charging and coaching. I love it when people say exactly what I need for the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if, which, which one, role A or role B, do people tend to get promoted on? A. Uh, which one, if we really believe people are our greatest asset, is crucially important? But it's okay, isn't it? We can promote people on that and train them in that because it's really easy to learn how to do role B, isn't it? Yeah? Um, how, so that, for, for, for me, is the fault line at the heart of management. The moment you split those two roles, a lot becomes possible. And that's what we do at Happy. We have one set of people who do strategy and decision making, and another set who do supporting, challenging and coaching. And we don't expect the same people to necessarily do the same thing. Yeah? So the result of that is that a lot becomes easier. Let's say you have somebody comes to you and says, I love my job. I love the people I work with. I'm even happy with what I'm being paid, but I can't stand my manager. How many have been that person? How many people have been that person? Yeah? What generally, what happened next? You what? You're moving into HR, okay. <laughs> uh, what often happens is people leave, yeah? People leave. You lose people because of that. If somebody says that at Happy, we say, fine, who would you like instead? We let people choose their manager. Okay. Because who, who, what would make more sense than the person who is to be managed, is to be supported, is to be challenged, choosing the person who's best to do that? How many of you would choose someone different? I have to be careful if you're with your manager here, but... <laughs> how many people would choose someone different if you could choose your manager? Survey last month found that 47% would choose someone different if they could choose their manager. Another survey found uh, about 45% of young workers would take a pay cut have a different manager. <laughs> yeah. Because what we have is a lot of people in posts, for all the best one in the world, um, who simply, uh, it isn't their strength. And how many of you know the strength finder analysis? Oh, a fair few. Good, good, good. Okay. Um, this is the concept that, which is crucial to creating happy workplaces, that 
Let's say you go to your appraisal and you come up with these are your, what you're great at, these are what you're not so good at. What's normally the next step? Work on the things you're not so good at. Yeah? What would be an alternative? Work on the strengths. Yeah? Spend your time doing what you're great at. And I know a couple of people, you know, Dom, you put that, you, you used that at, uh, at Vaxpace? And Pier 1, what was the effect? Absolutely. Put very well, I thought, there. yes. Okay, and so some people's strength isn't management. Yeah. Some people, have, if I have an order, well, let's, let's try this with the managers here. How many of you have managers that love managing people? It's what motivates you, what gets you up in the morning. There's normally quite a few. Hands up. How many um, would rather not be doing the managing people bit? Okay, even in this audience, there's, 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 there's a few of those. Okay. So imagine you could set up the organisation so that was possible, so that those people didn't get to manage people. So let me give you a scenario we worked with, a company where the marketing director was absolutely brilliant, um, absolutely the organisation wanted to keep her, but the effect on her, her staff was that half of them left every year. Hmm? The company wanted to get away from that, so quick chat with your neighbour again. What's the solution? How do you keep the marketing director but motivate the staff? Just a minute on this one, because it's an easy one. Okay. I'm going to tell you what we did, and I, I'm willing to bet a fair few of, would come up, of you have come up with the same solution. We took the marketing director, and she became marketing consultant, still on the staff, fully paid, uh, same, same, same pay. And we found somebody in the organisation who was good, at mani good with people, and trained them, and they became the manager of the department. How many people came up with a roughly similar solution to that? Okay. Now, keep your hands up if you could do it in your organisation. Okay, good. Some, good. That's a fair number. Good. Okay. It simply makes sense. Guess who was happiest at that solution? The marketing director. Because a lot of people often ask, but what about the poor manager who gets to lose their position as manager? It's absolutely win-win because what she knows she, she's great at is marketing. What she loves doing is marketing. These... These ideas and the ideas in the book are kind of... Uh, there's there's a, uh, a question that Julian Birkenshaw asks. Is Julian here? Actually, no? Okay. Uh, he's, he's, he's written the foreword on the book, which he asks, what would management be like if it was decided by the people who are managed? Yeah? And it would probably be a lot more effective, but it would be based around these kinds of ideas. And people expect a lot more at work now. There's a very interesting... Piece of opinion poll we were involved in last month. We asked people, do you, do you simply, how many of you come to work to pay the bills? Just to pay the bills. I, the alternatives were, it's, you know, it's, somebody said yes, they do. <laughs> um, that, uh, is, it, is it very important to be happy at work? Is it quite important to be happy at work? Or do you just come to work to pay the bills? What percentage do you think come to work just to pay the bills? Somebody guesses, shout out. 20% over there? 60%? 70%? 2%. Only 2% of respondents. This is office jobs. Um, and it means you know whether it's different from the, you know, the old manufacturing plants of 50 years ago. But only 2% come to work purely to pay the bills. 90% say it's either very important or quite important to be happy at work. And there's an, I can't remember what the other 8% were, but they said something else. Um, but that's what people expect now. And as Mark showed earlier, half the population are not happy at work. Half the population, and as a result, are not going to be as effective, as productive as they would be otherwise. So, this, uh, this book, this event, this, this alliance with Action for Happiness, is about a campaign, a call for a move to happier workplaces. Because they're not just better for the people who work in them, they're also better for the organisations. The financial proof is there, the evidence is there, it's very clear. <coughs> but, so just before I close, I'm going to just ask you to, to again talk to your neighbour, because I want you to, to want to know any thoughts as a result of this. So, one simple question, one thing I like about these ideas. Grab some, if it's possible, to talk to somebody you haven't talked to, but otherwise, talk to somebody you have. One minute on that one. <laughs> Next question. 
question. Having thought about one thing you like, one thing you will do. Because as I say, this isn't just about selling the book, it's about changing the workplace. So what will you do with these ideas back at your workplace? Carry on the discussion. How many people came up with at least one thing they'll do in their organisation this week with these ideas? Yeah. yeah. Hopefully, some of you, yes, good. Okay, I'll come to a close there, but with that thought that we can change the way we work, we can create uh, different, can create more effective organisations. And I would urge you to join this and create those organisations. I'm Henry, I'm happy, I hope you are too. <laughs> okay, um, I'm sure you're all um, full of questions you'd like to ask Henry about his experiences with happy. When, um, I've been... Um, inspired by that as I have been when I've heard Henry speak before and I'm reminded of um, uh, something I heard about, you, you know, I'm sure many of you are aware that the government is, is planning to, to measure well-being and there have been lots of um, tests done on how to measure people's well-being um, in quite sci scientific controlled ways where they ask people sort of th regularly throughout the day how they're feeling when they're different, doing different experiences and um, one bit of research in the US I think looked and found that I mean the top things that made you happiest during the day tended to be being with your loved ones and, and so on. Um, bottom of the list, I think, was probably commuting. Next up from bottom of the list was being with my boss. And I, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and I think that um, I think probably it sounds like that's probably not what people say at Happy. And hopefully, what we can do um, together is create more organisations where people are not likely to be leaving the organisation because of the relationship they have with their boss. Quite yeah, the yeah, I mean, one question I often ask is, um, let's say you get into work and you see a note on your desk that your boss wants to see you at 2.30. Do you think, <laughs> great, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> because if, if our managers are supporting us, then we should. Yeah, indeed. So, questions to the floor. I saw a hand up over here. Well, I, I really have one, and it's, it's because Henry came from an IT background. <laughs> <laughs> so, they need some training. It's going to save us and uh, doesn't seem to have done so. I just wondered if you have any thoughts on uh, modern IT work practices. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the one you were expecting, was that, it? I've never, I've never had that one before. Uh, uh, I, well, I think, I mean, uh, you know, I've been slightly biased in my answer to this one because of where I come from. But my whole experience is that people are given IT and not taught properly how to use it, you know. Do you know the average budget for, the average spend on an individual on IT training in a year? Any guesses? Zero. Zero, somebody <laughs> said. It's fairly close to that. It's four pounds. <laughs> that means you probably go on a training course once every 30 years, on average. <laughs> and yet people wonder why, we get, why people get frustrated and annoyed with their IT. The people we love training most are people who have taught themselves, you know because uh, or been, just had it thrust in front of them and not been given any training, because they suddenly, we suddenly, there are so many moments of, wow, I could do that. I could save that much time. I could do that. So, um, I mean, I suppose I could talk about atomization of the workplace that we're all stuck in front of our things, but I just think we need to help people become more effective in using that technology, because it can be liberating. Another question over here. Uh, hello, um, I'm Anna, and I run a co-working space called The Hub. And we provide Excellent. Well, that's, a, that's a very good question. I do often talk to, to people in startups, particularly uh, School for Social Entrepreneurs. I often talk to the, the people starting up there. Obviously, a lot of what I'm talking about is management. Um, but there's a lesson there for startups. I mean, I, I start on this philosophy when we had three members of staff. And I was a stressed out small businessman. I was ringing back every day from holiday to check, you know, everything was okay. Um, you know, I certainly couldn't have grown the business to where it is now on the basis of that. And I read a book called Maverick. And I know there's at least one other Maverick fan here. Who, who's read Maverick? Oh, lots of you. Okay. Maverick by Ricardo Semler. It's in the back of the book, the reference on it. It's, in my biased opinion, the best business book ever written. Well, you might want 
might as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and it tells the story of this. Well, it's a much. It's not. It's not a startup, but it, of, a, of this guy who inherited his factory from his dad. The level of trust was such that workers were searched on the gates every day. And he moved it to the all sort of organisation I'm talking about, where workers were completely trusted, set their own targets, created their own workplaces, created their own work environments, and even set their own salary in many cases. Now, that may sound you know, not very near to where you are, but the result was a year later, when I was off for three weeks, I was able to not ring back at all and came back to two phone messages to answer. And sales had grown. Yeah? Because I, the, the whole nature of the organisation had changed from top down to enablement, and every single member of staff at Happy gets a copy of Maverick to read, um, which I would rec recommend to any of you who haven't read it. So, but for, for entrepreneurs, yes, it's about getting the support, and it's also a crucial part of the book, is about love, work, get a life. That's one of the principles I haven't talked about. And I don't think the entrepreneurs working into the night, 80-hour weeks, is actually how they become most effective. So yes, I would, I would sit down with them and talk about what support you need, how do you make sure you are well rested and well nurtured, because if you're going to be effective, you're going to be need, need to be that. Another question lady over here. I think we all want to be happy. <laughs> I like to take a positive view. I, inevitably, we react back to others like we're, we're, like, like we're dealt with. I mean, my first management experience was not a very positive one. Um, I don't, some of you know the story of how I was involved in setting up a Sunday newspaper. Um, we raised six and a half million pounds. It's going to be a radical campaigning, left of centre paper that was going to change the world. We raised six and a half million pounds and we lost it all in six weeks. Um, and we created a hellish place to work. Uh, not deliberately, it was supposed to be great, hugely principled. But we took our model of management from the people who'd managed us and the people we'd seen. I often <laughs> joke that, you know, our only model of management in popular culture then was what we saw in Dallas. <laughs> now, some of you are too young to remember Dallas, I know, but um, um, that was, there was a lot of shouting at, at people was the basis of management. We, so we, 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 we work from what we know, and a lot of us have, have experienced a bad management, and that's what we practice. So, but that can be changed. Hi, and you've talked about the top-down changes that can be made to make management more effective and a happier workplace for staff. What can individuals do to upwardly manage to make their happiness more apparent? Uh, absolutely. I mean, that's the point about, you know, all of us can work on principles like people work best and they feel good about themselves. Yeah? Um, what's the best thing to do with your manager? Manage, Manage them. Make them feel good. Yeah? Management is actually quite a lonely occupation often. Particularly the CEO at the top can be very lonely indeed. Um, and feel attacked, feel criticised, feel all of those things all the time. Just as with your members of staff, they work best when they feel good about themselves. The same is true of your manager. I don't mean being insincere or anything like that. I mean genuinely supporting them, helping them, um, and finding that they will probably make better and more flexible decisions if they do feel supported and nurtured. I, at one point at Happy, had a support group. You know, people who worked with me to, to, to support me and help me uh, make better decisions. Um, it was a crucial point in Happy where actually the person set up felt I was overworking and wanted to support me to look at working in a different way. So we can build those kind of support structures. You can make, it, make your colleagues feel good about themselves by being supportive. You can do it with your managers as well. Can I just add a, a personal example on that one as well, which is um, one, of the, one of the bits of evidence on happiness, which is really important in the workplace in particular, is about the contagious nature of our emotions, mm -hmm. uh, both positive and negative. But we now know from quite extensive longitudinal analysis of hundreds of people that our, our happiness can not only affect our friends and, and direct colleagues, but also passes through three degrees of separation. So our friends, 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 or our colleagues, you know, friends, wife, to take a, a random example. So, uh, <laughs> I hope that's a, an unfortunate example. <laughs> uh, this wasn't the personal story I was planning on sharing. <laughs> um, 
but, um, but, but we can all affect um, the, you know, the, 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 how people feel around us. And the great example I, I had of that was a, a PA that came into work in, in the department that I ran in a previous company. I had about 25 people I, that worked for me. She came in and had, a, I think, a far more profound impact on the performance of the team that I ran than I ever did. I'm happy to admit that she did more for us than, than, than I did because of the way she was. She made people feel good. She connected people mm -hmm. together. She brought a sense of positivity and humour and sort of... Uh, engagement that just transformed how everyone felt about that team and indeed how other people felt around the organisation about working with us. So people can make a difference. Um, response up there as well. Uh, uh, Donald Carroll, Critical Difference. I did a review of the book on Amazon uh, called it Intentional Happiness. Uh, <laughs> like that's a purpose. But uh, some of the stories that are going around, I'm reminded of the, the weak manager within an IT firm and the staff, he, he said to the staff, look, my laptop's a bit too heavy. Can you help me? And they said, yeah, just delete the <laughs> there's, there's something about the relationship in there, but there's something, I think there's something else going on in the book, which is you're, you're actually eliminating or at least replacing management with more accountable, responsible, self managing. Any, any comments on that? That's a very good point, actually, because a, a key element of this is accountability. Mm. Yeah? If actually people are told what to do and don't have much uh, say in it, it's actually much harder to hold them accountable. In fact, if, you, if the person has decided their targets, is in charge of their work, they can be held much... Uh, the, part, of, part of the deal is accountability. At Happy Computers, I believe we have the highest standards in the IT training industry. We've been in the top two for the uh, IT Training Company of the Year awards for five of the last six years. Nobody comes close to us, and every trainer at Happy knows that uh, the expectation of them and are absolutely accountable for it. So yeah, I'm very glad you pointed that out because the accountability that comes as part of this package is why working like this is a key reason why working like this is so much more productive. Thanks for that reminder. Dom. Henry, the, um, the negative impact that miserable people have <laughs> can be, depending on what city you're in, three to five times more corrosive than the positive impact happy people can have. How do you feel about getting rid of <laughs> I think you have strong views on that, don't you, Dom? And, and a track record, don't you? As well. <laughs> um, being positive and supportive is a key part of our expectation of anyone that's happy. It's some, one of the things we recruit for. It's the thing that we promote on. Um, a lot of organisations say we want people to support each other and then they promote on how high their sales were or their technical skills or something else and give a mixed message. We're very clear at Happy that that's a key part of the deal. And yeah, actually, if you're not positive and supportive of, of, of others, that should be part of the whole performance management. So while I might not put it quite as beautifully as I suspect Dom would, I would tend to agree that being, being, that being positive and happy is a key part of progression. That's an interesting question. So do you have a lot of clients like that? Or? Um, at times, it can seem that we've got a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> Did everyone uh, hear the question in that case? Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, there have been one or two times in Happy's Past where we have sacked a client because they were having a negative effect uh, on, or, you know, on, on uh, the organisation. And they were too much too demanding and too unreasonable to deal with. Um, but normally, I, what I, what, I mean, I have to say, I do find that that is very, very rare. And that actually, if you're having a problem with a client, you've got to look at what you're doing and your relationship and what your people are doing. But you have to be providing full support to your people. 
Um, I mean, it reminds me of, of a, a company called HGL. Who knows HGL? Anybody? The boss of HGL wrote a book called Employees First, Customers Second. Yeah? Very good book out last year. HGL is an 80,000 strong Indian outsourcing company. So it's not a, not a small outfit. But the great thing about Vinit, who runs that, is that he took that, he's taken that philosophy to, the, to his clients. He hasn't just got to something internal. He says to his clients, we put employees first, customers second, and we want you to do that too. So he's actually, I don't know, I don't know how they reacted actually, but um, he, he's actually taken that philosophy out, and I would very much take our philosophy of, you know, it's about we want our employees to feel good and we expect them to be treated well out to the clients if, if they weren't doing that. to sometimes the happy word is thrown around a lot and actually what you want is people who are kind of generally positive but emotionally mature. Yes, and, and yeah, I, I would agree with that. And the key role of a manager who is this kind of people manager that we're talking about <coughs> is to have an open and honest relationship <coughs> with their person, to hear when they've got problems and to, to, to work with them on that. And there's a kind of distinction between dumping your stuff in the middle of the office on everybody and the, the, being open and upfront with the manager that actually life is difficult at the moment. This is what I'm going through. This is what's happening. Um, and the manager's role is crucial. Let me say a little word or two about the manager because there's a principle that we all know, the golden rule. P, uh, treat others as you would like to be treated. Is that a good basis for management? Uh, we would say no, actually. It isn't. A much better basis is treat people as they would like to be treated. Which is very different. I might like to be praised in public and sung to the rooftops. I know Vicky would hate that. You know, she would like somebody to take her side in a room. But most, most managers, uh, or a lot of managers, will tend to treat other people as they want to be treated. Yeah, because that, that's what they think motivates them, because that's what motivates them. The key skill, if you go, go to the strength finder analysis, um, the key skill for managers is individualization. The ability to understand that every individual is different and to understand the motivation of that person. Yeah. The, the, if you want to look at the strength finder, the, the book is in the back of mine, which is a book called Now Discover Your Strengths, um, where you'll discover yours, and all our people have done it, so we, they all know the strengths. Henry, another, 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 close, aspect, of, another yeah. aspect of Rhett's question there is about the obvious, the obvious problems that do happen in any workplace. And you do also talk about celebrating failure and how to deal with failure. Do you want to say a little bit about that as well? Yeah, who's into celebrating mistakes? Come on, a few more. Anybody else? <laughs> um, do we want mistakes? Yes. yes. Why do we want mistakes? <coughs> we learn from them. Um, if we're in an organisation where no mistakes happen throughout saved me a year with no mistakes, would it be good? It'd be pretty dead, wouldn't it? Um, I mean, the story I tell in the book is of a, somebody who was on one of my courses and worked for a company called Huntsman in the northeast. Anybody know Huntsman? Somebody? No? They're a big chemical company. Uh, in Huntsman, there's a big red button on the wall. And if you press the red button, all the chemicals get discharged into the local river. <laughs> so it's not good to press it. Um, so one day, the scaffolders were in, and there was a scaffolder walking along. <laughs> and I go, guess what happened? He pressed the red button. Um, when his company found out about it, because he worked for the contracting company, they sacked him. But what was interesting was the huntsman reaction. The huntsman, huntsman insisted he be reinstated, insisted he be sent back to work for huntsman, and had a little party to thank him. Why, do you think? Because they now know about the red button, as somebody says. They, there's a bit I missed out, which was his reaction. His reaction was not to... Nobody saw him do it. He could have just gone off and nobody would have known. 
Uh, he went into the control room and said, I've pressed this button, something's flashing, I don't know what's going on. It meant they could solve it in 30 minutes with minimum environmental damage and no fine, whereas it would have taken them 24 hours otherwise to work out what was wrong. Because the problem is very rarely the mistake, the problem is the cover-up. If you have got a blame culture where people are afraid to own up to things, then, um, then you, will, you, you will have big problems with mistakes. Um, and the message that went around Huntsman like wildfire was we are a no-blame organisation where you can honestly open up to your mistakes. And that makes a huge difference to what sort of organisation you have. Can I just jump into that? Just a second? Yeah. I just wondered, um, I'm pretty new to this, uh, this uh, <coughs> cultural climate, if you like. Um, one of the things that strikes me is that in, in our organisation is that um, too often the words challenge and support are the rest of the conflict. You know, if you challenge someone, they become defensive. Mm -hmm. And then that person then says, well, I'll support you as well. The last person you want to be supported by is the person who's just challenged you. And I just wonder <laughs> what, if you've got any ways of fleshing that out in a kind of supportive way, positive way. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's a good point. And that, that all comes down to that relationship between the manager and the individual. And remember, coming back to, you know, that person can change that manager if, it's not, if they're not supporting them. We're not the only people to do that, by the way. Do you know a company called Gore? Have you heard of Gore? I'm sure. How many people use Gore-Tex products? Yeah? Um, that's a massive, multi-billion organisation, been rated the most innovative in the United States, and they let people choose their managers. In fact, they're more radical than us, because at Happy, you have to be a manager to be chosen. At Gore, you can choose anybody. They can just join last week or whatever. It's the person you feel will be most supportive of you. So, if you have an antagonistic relationship with your manager in the blame culture, then that's going to happen. But if the culture is supportive and a no-blame culture, I think it can be very different. And that's, everything changes if you can really, and I'm not saying it's easy, you know, happy isn't, isn't perfect, and there's a lot, you know, of this that sometimes we don't get it, don't do what I'm talking about, sometimes we get it wrong. But I've seen that when we can follow those principles, you can create a truly great culture. I better start to come to a... I think probably one or two more if there are any more. So about the books, you were going to ask me yeah, stage so, question. So, so <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, uh, the, book, the book's on, on sale here today, presumably. It yeah. is. <laughs> um, <laughs> I gather, I, I gather because I think I was involved, that you're, you're trying to help crowdfund this book in some way. Absolutely. How does that work? And, um, and how I did to, I get roped into it? Yeah. <laughs> no. I went to a seminar on crowdfunding. Do you know about crowdfunding? The idea that you finance books through getting a crowd, not books, anything, you know, companies, by getting a crowd together. So, this is the last night you can do this. Some people have already signed up to this. If you buy 20 books, you get them for £100. They're £8 outside normally. Uh, you get them for £100 and you get a 1% stake in the print run. So you get 1% of the income from this print run of, we've got 2,500 books that we're selling in this print run. Yeah? So, if anybody's interested in that, this is the last time you can sign up for that. And thank you for asking me about that. <laughs> Could you explain that a bit more? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? So, if 100 people do this, you don't get any of the... Uh... But I'm going to limit the number who can do it. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's that 10%. percent Yeah. I'm going to limit it to, to 20% of the uh, number. We've got about 10% uh, uh, funded so far. By the way, can I say a special thank you to Tim Creswell from Caswell. Create... Caswell. 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 <laughs> uh, I'll celebrate that mistake. Um, <laughs> from Creative Communications. I hope you'll have a look at what he's been doing. Uh, but uh, I'll plug that again. Creative Communications, if any of you would like Creative something simple. <laughs> If you want to contact him, you'd better ask him, because he'll get involved. <laughs> OK, and thank you very much. I think we're probably, I'll, be, I'll be available for questions, for uh, drinks outside. Buy his book. I think it's called Mildly Content. <laughs> <laughs>